privilege it is for me to kind of introduce uh, Dr. Kobe Francis. I've uh, used his services a number of times with different students and other people that come my way. And I think all of us will find that his approaches are creative, enlightening, not only consistent with Torah, but are kind of based fundamentally on the most fundamental principles of Musar and ethical and character development. Uh, the issue of homosexuality is certainly not new. In fact, the Torah addresses it. If it wouldn't have been something that was in existence uh, to a certain degree, the Torah would not have addressed it at all. But I think we face really unparalleled challenges in this modern era. Essentially, what was always perceived as a yotze dofen, as something a bit off the beaten track, now becomes normalized, legitimated, even celebrated. Normalization, legitimation, celebration of deviance is a very, very serious avla that can radically affect our whole family structure. There's an amazing chazal in Bereshus Rabbah that talks about the various sins of the Dor Hamabu. And it mentions that their greatest sin, their different interpretations, is that they wrote a ketuba for Mishkab Zohar. Now note, it does not say the sin of homosexuality or homosexual uh, sexual expression. Rather, a sin is a sin, and that's pretty bad, if you recognize it as a sin. But when it is elevated into a virtue, you write a ketubah, you have a marriage ceremony, you try to make it something that is l'chatchila, the proper way, that is very, very, very destructive. The importance of family and marriage in Judaism cannot be overstated. Uh, at the very beginning, God said, Lo tov adam levado. it is not good for man to be alone. I will make him a helpmate to be opposite him. And that was the heterosexual relationship of Adam and Chava. The Jewish family is so fundamental to Jewish identity that the very first institution that a community must establish is not the synagogue and not the yeshiva, but it is a mikvah, which enables the intimate relationship of husband and wife. So wholly apart from the individual struggles that people have, which of course have to be addressed, we have to be vigilant in not legitimating deviance and not elevating it into a virtue and to understand what our response should be. And hence this lies, uh, this is really the source of our problem. Because on one hand, I think I have to make it clear, and I think I could speak for all of us. None of us are homophobic in the narrow sense of hating a person, looking down to a person, delegitimating their worth and their value. Any human being that is struggling is deserving of compassion, deserving of respect. We're not talking about phobias. We're not talking about hatreds. We're not talking about rejection. So the problem is, as a Rav, what do I do? On one hand, I have the values of the Torah that says this is not an acceptable lifestyle. On the other hand, I have people in pain who are seemingly struggling and I have to respect them and I have to validate them in some sense. So unfortunately, we've tended to go to one extreme or the other. Either we take the position, as Gary said, I'll just give you a big hug and celebrate your lifestyle because it's not changeable. Or we have the other modality of conversion therapy and the like, which kind of says, maybe that is your nature, but we're going to break it. We're going to twist it. We're going to change it. Well, once again, you see, there's something wrong with both of those ideas. To accept deviance as normal within a framework of Torah is totally unacceptable, particularly when it has repercussions to our family structure. On the other hand, to talk about having to break a nature, to change a nature, not so easy. But we saw Solantra remarked about things maybe less deep than this. It is easier to learn the entire Talmud than it is to change one character trait. What I think the greatness and the brilliance of Dr. Francis's work is I think he's created a third alternative, which avoids the binary notion of either blind acceptance or kind of brutal character transformation. And that is simply to understand the facts that the person who is struggling needs to understand exactly what it is that they are struggling with. 
to kind of turn on the lights. The famous mushal that the Bali Musr give is you can't really defeat darkness by a baseball bat, but you get rid of the darkness by turning on the light. And by enabling a person who is going through this same-sex attraction struggle to understand what the dynamics are, to understand why they feel this way, to understand that maybe they're misinterpreting certain feelings and taking them in the wrong direction. This is not a matter of trying to change a person, which by definition will not always be very successful. This is a matter of the person understanding what their true nature really is. It is a process of discovery rather than change and transformation. And as such, it is already within the person's personality. And that makes change, behavioral change, feasible, possible. And as long as the mo motivation is there, an achievable, realistic goal. So I do think that this third way that avoids the extremities of blind acceptance or brutal kind of destruction of, of character, I think is the way that the Bali Musr often talk about, that basically they always tell us that the key to changing yourself for the better is understanding the processes that create the conflicts within you. I believe that's also the highest therapeutic goal as well. So in this sense, um, I'm very, very excited uh, to uh, participate in Dr. Francis's presentation. And I think all of us will learn a great deal. Thank you. Dr. Kobe Francis is an Orthodox clinical psychologist in private practice who is involved in training rabbis and therapists on effective common sense and religiously compatible approaches to same-sex attraction and sexual identity confusion, as Rabbi Eretz just said. In his 15 years of practice, he has helped hundreds of men and women from Haredi, Hasidic, Sephardic, and modern Orthodox backgrounds resolve their distress and create meaningful heterosexual marriages and families. Without further ado, we turn the mic over to today's presenter. Dr. Francis, are you with us? Hello, hello. Hi, sorry about that delay. Can everybody hear me okay? Yep, perfect. Good, great, 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 great. Thank you, thank you for that, such kind introductions. Thank you for being here today on uh, Sunday. Uh, if you're uh, if you're where I am in the U.S., it's okay, it's a Sunday morning. If you're elsewhere in Israel, it's the end of your day. I really, really, uh, I'm so glad you're all here uh, with us. I hope you'll get something out of this today. Uh, I especially, especially want to thank uh, Dr. Chaim Newhoff for hosting and Gary Schiff for his energy and enthusiasm, and of course for my Breitowitz for basically summing up my talk in one minute. <laughs> you did a great job. Um, so. Uh, with, yes, let me let me get into it, and I'm going to um, I'm going to speak through slides, and I'm going to follow my slides pretty closely, which I think is easier. Um, it just keeps everybody on the same page, you know, you know, literally. Uh, so let me just take a second to do that. Uh, share screen, center view, share uh, slideshow. I'm beginning. And last but not least, this little button here. And oh, how how Dr. Newhoff, does that look okay? Yeah, that's perfect. Thank you. I may want to remind everyone about you know if there'll be time for questions, etc. Just to set up. Yes, 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 for sure. Let me just move my little. Um, okay, great. We're ready to go. Okay, so. Um, we are all here together today to talk about uh, same-sex attraction and sexual identity distress. And we're here because uh, there's not a lot of information out there. There's not a lot of opportunity to speak together on this topic. Um, and so it's, uh, it's very important that we're all here um, to maybe hear a different approach. I'm going to try and be really big picture um, with the hope that that can then be uh, easier to understand this, the smaller questions that you might have. 
Um, and some of what I talk about today might challenge what you already know, or already think. And so I'm just going to ask that uh, for your openness, for your, for your curiosity, and for your patience as I talk. Um, and I promise um, I'll do my best to answer questions at the end. So let me show you the schedule. Um, my next slide. Okay, so this is just the schedule. I'm going to just provide some theoretical and philosophical background on the topic. And I'm going to do that by talking about my journey as a therapist and what I learned along the way. And after I do that, I'm going to get to the main event, which is the six myths that I'm sure uh, most, if not all of us, have encountered, whether directly or indirectly. I want to make those myths really explicit and then, of course, uh, challenge them. And and then um, I hope to have a to have Q and A uh, at the end, and I'd love to hear from you. Um, if you have questions as I'm talking, just write them down. You don't you don't have to put them. In, I don't even know if you can put them in the chat, but um, just write them down. Um, bring them up at the end. I don't want you to be distracted uh, and, and miss the next slide. Okay, so here I will begin, and I'm going to talk about my my the beginnings of my training and why I was so, so uh, excited about clinical psychology when I started training. And he, here is, is a sort of a list of reasons, list of values that really, really made sense to me. I loved that there was open debate about the concepts and theory and in practice that people were sharing diverse ways to treat all kinds of issues. I loved that we were not bringing politics into our classroom and into the therapy room. As a professor once said, you know, PC being politically correct, we take that out of the room. It's not where we're, it's not what we bring in. I loved that it was always about that our theories, our ideas were always about promoting agency and not victimhood, that people always had choices. Uh, I loved that we were not just throwing blanket labels on people. We were actually being really thoughtful and precise about the diagnosis when we met our clients. And I don't just mean a DSM diagnosis, a label. I mean like really thoughtful understandings of where things were coming from. For the most part, the theories that I was learning and reading about were against biological determinism, which is the fancy word for saying that our biology directly causes our behavior. Uh, there was there was a even the most biologically oriented uh, psychiatrists and, and, and therapists did not have such a staunch view uh, of biology causing behavior. I loved. I'm just reading down my list. I love that we always thought about people's deeper motives, whether their behaviors, feelings, and identity. There was a huge focus on offering therapy to people that was culturally compatible, that was compatible with their values. And, and last, there was always an understanding that, that the field of psychology was operating in a larger context and that science was impacted by that context, that there may not always be such a thing as objective and timeless science because science was changing as norms and values were changing. So we were always thinking about the big picture as we talked about, as we thought about our ideas. Now, some of you may know where I'm going here because when I started my practice and people started to come to me with issues related to same-sex attraction and sexual identity, I was learning that all these ideas had to be suspended. I was learning not to think this way about people. And it was very... Uh, disorienting, and I was very skeptical. The kinds of issues that I was seeing, uh, by the way, that little guy on the side here, that's me, <laughs> scratching my head. The kinds of issues that I was seeing were, were basically, there were five. There was, I'm going to start from the top, involuntary same-sex arousal. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to make up names of clients. Obviously, they're not the, the real ones. Um, so John uh, would be learning in the base medrash, and uh, an attractive guy would pass by, and he couldn't help but feel something and uh, even some arousal. And it was involuntary; he wasn't looking for it. It was just it just happened to him. Going to the next, uh, sometimes people would complain to me that um, they just didn't 
they were not interested in the opposite sex, at least from afar. They weren't looking, they weren't having crushes, they weren't aroused on dates. And that was the focus of their complaint. Other people came to the next with the next box. Uh, they were completely preoccupied and had compulsions, sexual compulsions to look at, to uh, have sexual relations with members of the same gender. And it was uh, a huge uh, waste of their time, in, in their words. And they were trying to get more control. And the next category was somebody who either was about to come out or already came out. And it was really bothering them that they didn't know how to reconcile their their sexual identity with their religion. Their family was giving them a hard time. They were feeling depressed about their future. It was all related to the idea of being gay. And the fifth was the fa families with parents of teens, parents of young adults would call me and say, what do I say to my son? What do I say to my daughter? They are telling me that they want to come out, that they did come out. How, what do I do? What do I do? Um, so these were some of the issues that I was, that I, right away, you know, right away when I opened my practice, I was getting many, many calls about these types of issues. And I'm sure um, for those of you who practice, you, you're seeing similar, uh, similar pre presenting issues. Where was I going to turn? I didn't have any classes in um, sexual orientation, in sexual identity. I hardly learned about um, sexual development. I had to do all that on my own uh, and in my internship um, and then with my own supervisors. And what I was learning was that there were two models and Rabbi Breitowitz summed it up so well. There were two models out there. Either you were going to be a gay affirming therapist where you blanketly um, told each client that they are inherently gay and they just have to do the best they can in their life. Um, and that was whether they wanted to be gay or not. That's what I was learning. Um, there might be more nuanced uh, ways of, of seeing it. Um, and on the opposite end were those who practice conversion and reparative therapy, who I want to, I don't want to generalize too much because there are many extremely skilled and well-meaning therapists in those who, who've trained in those ways. But from a big picture perspective, those therapies were saying there's something inherently wrong. It's a developmental fixation. It's uh, there's something inherently, inherently uh, wrong. Now you'll notice that these two models, gay affirming and conversion and reparative therapy have completely different views about whether same-sex attraction is an illness or not. They have completely different views about whether one can change their orientation, so to speak, but they share the same philosophical bedrock that there is something, if someone has same sex attractions in a recurring way, that this means there's something ingrained, something ill, there's something very, very uh, more problematic. It's not just a symptom, it's something that reflects uh, an, an inner core. Uh, issue. And I call that the essential, oh, by the way, yes. So the name for that, there's a, there's a name for that idea that our qualities, you know, what that one quality, one behavior, one feeling, uh, one thought is, is all of who we are, defines us. And that idea is called essentialism, as it is known in the social science. Uh, and essentialism was uh, was a philosophical uh, common ground between both the gay affirming and the conversion and reparative therapy models. Um, now you could see some of the some of the um, common same-sex attraction, you must have had some developmental family issue, a distant father and a meshed mother. Um, you must, uh, therapy, you know, with enough therapy, you can change this ingrained, this ingrained developmental construct. Um, and the, uh, some other words that were used by some, some well-known thinkers in this field are psychosexual immaturity. A person with same-sex attraction had this global psychosexual immaturity or a gender insecurity. So all these big fancy words to describe people with same-sex attraction. And then let's turn to the gay affirming side. 
Um, and we, most of us understand these lines, sec, you know, they would claim sexual orientation is genetic. They would claim you have to affirm, therefore it's almost like a handicap. You have to affirm their gay identity. They can't help themselves. That those were the two lines. And I have these uh, people putting their fingers in their ear because these two models were so polarizing. So there was no way they could hear each other. There was no way they could talk to each other and there was no way they could debate. So it almost looked it almost looked like the way, you know, uh, like United States uh, politics with Republicans staunchly on one side and Democrats and staunchly on another side and nobody, everybody's just uh, demonizing the other and sticking in their lane. Um, meanwhile, I don't, there were a lot of therapists and my, I'm speaking for myself who didn't like these, either of these models, who didn't like the idea of somebody with same sex attraction being inherently different. I thought that was a very disparaging way of of seeing people and and how could it be a jewish way of seeing people seeing our fellow brothers and sisters that's inherently different um yeah and uh so these two models again they sh they were both coming from this essentialist uh point of view let me just take a look up here yeah Right, and what did this lead to in the broader? Uh, what did this lead to in the broader world? In the broader world, essentialism led to the same old polarizing questions: Can you change a person's orientation? Yes or no? This was in the Jewish community. This is being. This is still being debated. Do you affirm or do you challenge somebody who says that they are gay or who says that they can't stop thinking about the same gender in a sexual way? Uh, should they marry or not marry the opposite sex? Is it dangerous, risky? Or on the other hand, is it uh, is it still something they have to do? Um, and the last one is, uh, what is a true gay, right? You know, is is it ten percent of the population? Is it twenty percent that is truly biologically gay? And how do you even know? And I found that when I looked, you know, I picked my head up from my textbooks and my supervisors and looked in the broader Jewish world, these questions were constantly being debated. And and you can look, you know, ten years back, twenty years back, in journal articles, in newspapers. The same questions, the same questions circling over and over again with people disagreeing based on their political affiliation more or based on their Hashkafic uh, affiliation and not so much based on their scientific knowledge. I was tired. <laughs> I was tired of these two uh, polarizing models and I needed for my client's sake for all those five issues that I talked to you about a few minutes ago, you needed a different model. I needed a different model. I found it in uh, a, uh, a philosophical, a philosophical, uh, I would call it a movement of sorts called social constructionism. Now, I don't want to bore you with too much philosophy here, but it is important. Essentialism in the, the in the field uh, of social sciences was always contrasted to uh, social constructionism, and social constructionism had a completely different way of seeing sex, the co the construct of sexual orientation, and the labels of gay, straight, bisexual, asexual, etc. That they were not natural; they were man-made. They were made for people to achieve certain rights and benefits, um, and that they aren't scientifically accurate and that sure enough lines up with most of the science that tries to show a that the sexual orientation is natural and biological but which consistently fails so this approach is uh is not as well known uh as essentialism essentialism is very uh, right now uh, has the upper hand in the broader western world but social constructionism used to be in the 70s and the 80s and in small pockets of uh, academic and scientific circles, it is still a very uh, alive and well, this, this belief. And in fact, many of the most well-known scholars in uh, gay studies who themselves uh, identify as gay are proponents of the social constructionist approach. They reject the idea that there is such a thing as an inherently heterosexual and inherently homosexual person. So this is coming from within gay identified people, within queer studies departments. Um, it is an approach that I think is worth considering. And some people might be hearing this and might be uh, saying, what? It's not biological. 
what? It's not inherent? Um, so I want to respect if you're having that reaction, I want to I want to make space for it. Um, I want to just ask that you that you stay with me um, because there are so many advantages to this social constructionist approach. Advantage number one, it's it's aligned with Judaism. If if in my in my opinion, uh, and we can discuss this later, um, if there were truly such a thing as an inherently gay or straight person, we would see this somewhere in in the Torah and Chazal. And there are many, many references to homosexual behavior. So we would see this somewhere uh, and somehow. So I think it's much more aligned with our with our Jewish perspective. I think it's very helpful for clinicians to align themselves with social constructionism instead of essentialism, because now they could ask the questions. And here, this is my last box here. Well, how do you explain same-sex attraction? There must be another reason. If it's not inherent, there must be another explanation. And I'm going to offer that to you today. And second, there must be a theory of why people wanted to identify as gay, because it isn't just people who have same-sex attraction that we need to understand. We need to understand people who desperately want to come out and desperately want to identify as gay, sometimes for non-sexual reasons. Social constructionism gives us a little bit of space so that we're not imposing these ideas onto our clients without being curious, without seeing what are you coming in with? What are you struggling with exactly and specifically? And so this was very encouraging when I found this uh, approach. And it's written about extensively, extensively in a, in a book called Mismeasure of Desire by Edward Stein, if, if any of you are interested. Um, okay, so that became my home in a way when I was working with those five issues, social constructionism. It freed me up to be curious. It freed me up to do everything that I normally do with any other client, which is to ask questions. Why, why, how did this come about? Where did this start? What is it for? When I started to listen even more closely to my clients, having, having put away the, all the static, uh, I started to listen um, even more carefully. And I noticed that all my clients, I'm not sure who's writing on this, is that me? All my clients um, were falling into one of these three categories. The one, the five that I talked about uh, in the very first slide, they were falling into these three categories. And this is what I spoke about last year. Uh, and I wanna go through it um, and recorded it so it is available um but i'll i'll review it and and um teach it in, in with enough detail that if you're new to this i think you'll be able to understand it so people came in with one of these three profiles let me let me tell you quickly what these three are okay we have the over what i call these are my names what i call the over pathologizer so let's start at the top a person who can mistake a wide array of normal patterns with being inherently gay. Anything from, I like Broadway shows. I have a passing crush on my friend. Um, I'm not athletic. People were coming to me and to other therapists who I supervised with worries that this meant they were inherently gay. Um, and it made sense because think about the newspapers you're reading, the the, the shows on, on TV and, and our social media, gay, 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 it's everywhere. It's everywhere in the world. So people uh, are wondering, is, is do I have this? Is this me? And it's very, it becomes very easy for them to wonder about it. Another reason why it's so common, I think, especially now, is because there's no actual test for sexual orientation. How does a person know if they are actually gay or not? I don't even think Google knows. If you Google, how do I know? I think Google will give you a very um, a convoluted answer. There's no test There's for this for a seemingly objective construct. We have no actual way of knowing. So if you don't know one way or the other, you can't take a test. So there's a lot of ambiguity. What if that's you? That's so that's another reason why some people are freaking out. Um, and then in gender segregated environments, like in many of our communities, imagine how much more so men are spending a lot of close time together, uh, women as well. They may not have 
interaction with the opposite sex until they start dating. So that creates a certain issue in terms of how common this could be. Um, and this is my belief. Um, I have yet to see it written about elsewhere, but I believe that maybe 20, 30 years ago, let's say when I was, was growing up, um, there were much, the, the taboos around homosexual behavior were much stronger. And so when I would interact with my friends, it's almost like I, it was, there was no Shyla. Like they were, these are my friends. But now I think now uh, because these taboos are relaxed, boys and men are kind of forced to think about it more. Oh gosh, I, do I like my friend too much? Is my is this is this an unhealthy crush? Is this sexual? Um, there's the the boundaries are down and people are having to work harder to think about it or to prop up boundaries. Theory that I'm kind of exploring. So this describes the over pathologizer, pathologizer, the client or the student who. the freaked out and the I'm okay with this, but they're all they're all overestimating. They're all uh, mistakenly applying this popular label to a broad array of patterns. This is called the over pathologizer. Our second, our second category, let me just take a little bit of water. Our second category, which uh, if there's one of the three uh, categories that I want you to understand, it's this one, this is so common. Um, and I believe a little bit more common in men than women, a lust trigger, a lust trigger. When I listen to my clients talk about their sexual attractions to the same gender, it could be a crush, it could be powerful urges, it could be fantasizing, it could be internet porn. It always followed this uh, recipe, this formula, sorry, this formula of, of an acronym that I call CRISP, um, childhood, recurring, immediate, specific, powerful. The, the specific fascination always started in childhood or early adolescence. It was a recurring theme. They always gravitated to the same type, the same type of man, the same type of body part, the same type of personality type. It was immediate. As soon as they thought about this person or saw them, immediate arousal, immediate excitement, uh, specific, I think I covered that, where it's not just a stom attractive uh, member of the same gender. It's not just a beautiful person. It's a specific quality, a specific trait, or a specific body part. And powerful. It was very potent, very potent sexual energy that they described to me. And many clients describe this to me as attraction. This is, the, I'm attracted to the same gender. I had to, you had to really peel away the layers and say, well, tell me more. Wait, what do you mean? And inevitably, nine out of 10 times, they would describe this constellation, this crisp, this crispy um, uh, constellation of qualities. And this I was familiar with from my training because I already knew about the idea of something that Freud called uh, perversions, which I don't think we like that term anymore. Um, later, it, it was uh, named things like sexual scripts or arousal templates. Scholars were writing about this and describing the same exact thing that I was that, that I'm telling you about today, just using different words. I happen to like lust trigger myself. And I hopefully I'll publish it soon. Um, now, here's the thing. I'm going to go to the next box here. A lust trigger could be it's the same no matter the gender. So a person could have this uh, these qualities for the same gender or the opposite gender. Some people, for example, are talking about high heels. Uh, men are talking about their immediate attraction to high heels their immediate powerful attraction to girls uh, who wear their hair in a certain way, to older women, to younger women, to people, uh, to certain um, to certain garments, to, to certain personality types. This was, I wasn't, because I wasn't, my practice was not just focusing on same-sex attraction. It was people with all kinds of issues and all kinds of sexual issues in the front community. And they were describing the same thing, the same gender or the opposite gender. So I realized this, we don't need to separate these uh, out by gender. This is all the same. And sure enough, when you explored its origin story, it had the same or similar origin story. And uh, as, as it's usually a coping reaction to stress developed early on. 
and a similar origin story and um, no need to, to, to divide people up by the gender or the object. I had a client, for example, who came in complaining that he was incredibly aroused by the smell of smoke. So was I going to call this guy a, a smoker? Uh, um, and he actually did find an online group, of course, of people who loved smelling smoke. Um, but people came in with such interesting and idiosyncratic arousal uh, triggers that it was didn't make sense to divide them up by the object. It was much more, it felt much more uh, accurate to focus on the sexual energy on the crisp uh, constellation. Yeah, so related to, in the orange box, related to childhood cross-wiring, a coping response often to early trauma, abuse or neglect, though I'm learning now, not necessarily, not necessarily. Um, I already covered how it's similar to these other concepts. Uh, and ladies and gentlemen, in my view, it's not inherent. If, if this person is uh, uh, is reporting this to me as an adult, it's there's nothing problematic about it. There there may be nothing problematic. We say, okay, this is your little thing. Um, you're you're okay. Lots of people have this. You're okay. Now there are three exceptions to that. You could probably guess what they are. The first is. If the person is so ashamed, oh my God, I, I'm aroused by smoke. What's How did this happen? What's wrong with me? They feel crazy. You can then, the counseling can help explain, no, I could actually show you a logical progression here and give you the theory of how that happens. The second problem could be if they become preoccupied and addicted to their lust trigger because lust triggers, no matter what they are, are so arousing and potent that they become easy to, uh, to be preoccupied with and can be used as a kind of drug to medicate stress. So obviously if they're addicted, no matter what it is, they would receive the same type of addiction type of treatment uh, or if it's not an addiction, maybe it's a compulsion. Um, and the last problem would be if they're comparing their lust trigger, their lust trigger arousal reactions to people who, to their dates in their life, to their spouses, to their partners in real life, to real people. So they're saying things like, well, I have this incredible attraction to, uh, let's say it's a girl saying, I have this incredible attraction to other girls with a certain hairstyle. And I don't feel, you know, when I see a guy, eh, cute guy, it doesn't turn me on at all. And they think there's something weird about that. They think that their true sexual identity and sexual energy, the, the healthy sexual energy is with the girl with the uh, haircut. And they expect, lust triggers are very, they really can confuse us because it causes people to expect to have the same reaction with real people, let's say on dates. I'll talk more about this, this idea uh, a bit later. Okay, this is a, a lot of words on this slide. So I wanna, what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna summarize it in the, in the interest of our time. Um, this is where, this third profile, this third profile, is where you have, which is becoming so much more common nowadays and so, so challenging, whether you're a therapist, a rabbi, a college teacher, a parent, so challenging. The child is attracted to the identity. And I'm calling it identity for closure because Eric Erickson, many years ago, one of the first uh, psychologists to, uh, to write about development in, in stages, talked about identity for closure is something that happens when kids, when young adults, they can't find themselves. They're in a community, they're in a family, and they can't figure out who they are, and they struggle. And what happens is that they latch on quickly. Something comes in the air, something something they that, that that's like piques their interest, that sounds cool and interesting, and they attach to it, even if it comes with a cost, even if it takes them away from who they are and from their their goals and their culture and their values. So identity for closure, I thought this was a great description for many people nowadays who are lost. They don't know who they are. They struggle for years in their childhood with their identity and then boom, gay. Ah, this is who I am. This is where I'm gonna feel comfortable. And some of these folks are in romantic and sexual same sex uh, relationships, some are not. I have, I have uh, young women talking to me now who say, I'm not gay, but I am LGBT. What does that mean? <laughs> not gay, but I'm LGBT. So they're not even, it's not even about sex. 
they're attracted to the community. They're attracted, they, they feel lost otherwise. And they're rigidly attached, they're rigidly attached because it is identity. Even more attached than I would say someone with a lust trigger sometimes. And I wanna say that some of these people are uniquely gifted, talented, different, and they have made have been made to feel less than. Maybe their community or their school wasn't the right fit and they were made fun of for being different. They were made to feel bad and, and that's a tragic thing. And so now when it comes to, uh, when they're introduced to the idea of LGBT or gay, it's incredibly uh, compelling, incredibly compelling. Just one quick example. Um, I had somebody, we'll call him John. Uh, John's mother, John was a 22 year old yeshiva boy and John's mother called me and said, my boy John is struggling with the same sex desires. He really doesn't want to be gay. He really wants somebody to help him understand this. And I said, ah, a lust trigger. I'm sure I could help him. I'm sure I could just give him a different set of words and that will help him see that he's not gay, that he has the same thing that many, that many men have toward women, that many women have toward men. I get on the phone with John and I ask him some details about his sex life. He's very guarded. Uh, this was, by the way, a terrible mistake on my part. I I, I, uh, I too quickly jumped in. I was too enthusiastic about my theory at that point. And um, I, I asked some details about his sexual desires. It, sure enough, it did line up with the lust trigger. It was specific. It went from certain childhood. It was a powerful arousal. And he was extremely angry. He was so angry. Uh, he accused me of being homophobic, of being a conversion therapist. Um, what am I saying? I, I, I was I was shocked. I thought, and, and the problem was that this boy had already latched onto the gay identity. This boy had a history of being bullied and excluded and have, ha, uh, was made to feel not good enough that when gay came around, it was like the sun was shining on him. And I, his mother didn't know that. And of course I didn't know that. And the lesson is never take the parent's description at face value. That's just an example here of contrasting lust trigger with identity for closure. Okay, I'm going to just move to the next. It was very, very heartening to know that these three profiles, this is what I would do for anybody. Uh, for example, over pathologizers, I'm going to go to that, uh, this, this pie on the left. Well, people are always coming in. Do I have ADHD? Do I have social anxiety? Confusing one symptom with a different uh, category. This was just another example. Am I gay? Moving on to lust trigger. Many of my clients The same exact thing. And last, identity for closure. Therapists are seeing this all the time, especially with young adults or teenagers. They don't know who they are. They loop, they, they fall between the cracks. They're, these individuals become extremely vulnerable to uh, fads and cults and all kinds of uh, things. I put borderline personality disorder because there was a time, and maybe it's still popular, where many young women who felt emotionally unstable were asking, what's, what's wrong with me? Why am I so different than my less sensitive uh, peers? And they said, ah, I have borderline personality. And many women were, were diagnosing themselves and felt this incredible sense of relief and comfort and belonging, even though this, this, is, a, this is not a great diagnosis, but it, it made them feel good and different and better than they were feeling before. So everything that I was doing with these three profiles was, was really aligned with the work that I was doing with anybody else. This was very, this helped me feel, you know, no, no guilt uh, at what I was doing. I was doing, I was being the therapist that I wanted to be and I was helping my clients. And sure enough, my clients were feeling many, I can't say all, many were feeling incredibly relieved to learn that they were not gay, that they, that there was a different name to their pattern. I want to tell you very quickly about a guy named, we'll call him Roger, 72 year old man, a pro man who uh, married with children, and he walked around with this secret his whole life that he was a closeted homosexual. He believed this, and he walked around with it, and of course, he never told a soul. And then he came up on my website, and it described certain things that gave him a sense that, like, what? Wait a second. And he calls me, and I, and I, you know, interview him. I give him, uh, uh, um, I assess what's going on, and I see this is a, this is a textbook uh, lust trigger, arousal template, 
uh, sexual script, you whatever term you like. This is this is textbook. You're not gay. And Roger, Roger, his whole face lit up, and he couldn't believe it. He couldn't believe it. He was not closeted gay. All this shame that he carried for 72 years, I mean, not 72 years, many decades, he went away. And Roger was so relieved, he would come to session the next five or six times saying, do you understand, Kobe, do you understand how life-changing this is? Do you understand what you've done for me? I've been in 35 years of therapy and no one's ever described it this way. No one's ever said it so simply. And you met me twice. This is incredible. And I'm, I'm not saying this to toot my own horn. I'm just describing the relief, the incredible and immediate relief people can get when you give them the You can really, really intervene. You can really give them the accurate term. No, you're just believing that you're gay unnecessarily. You don't need to think of yourself this way. Or you have this lust trigger. And so I just put in these boxes, I don't wanna read every single one, all this unnecessary distress that we can help people prevent if we catch it early. If you're a Rebbe, if you're a, if you're a counselor, if you're a therapist, if you're a call teacher and you're hearing things that sound like either lust trigger or like they're overblowing this, you can do so much. You could change their life in one conversation. You can help them to avoid all this mental and emotional distress, all this family and community conflict. And I was so excited about these findings that that's what, what motivated me to speak last year with uh, with Dr. Newhoff uh, about this, these ideas, to mostly to a therapist crowd. But these, I, I was very interested in speaking to also to rabbis and educators about this as well. They should know this. All right, this is my <laughs> background. So I'm luckily, uh, it's almost 10 o'clock. So <clears throat> luckily, the meat of this presentation is much shorter than this, but this is important background. And so if you're ready, I can't see your faces um, because I'm in the slide mode, but I'm hoping that you're following and doing okay. Um, I'm going to now go to this next section and hopefully I could wrap this up in 10, 15 minutes. And the next section is about the following. I'm gonna skip this. Um, it's not enough. What I learned was that you can't, uh, somebody, a first responder, like a therapist, a rabbi, a teacher, a parent, they, it's not enough to just have three these three profiles and to sort of have this roadmap. It's great. It's not enough because people are walking around with ingrained myths about sexuality, relationships, and desire that are utterly fantastical and utterly crazy and that we need to bring out into the open. We need to identify and challenge. And that is so much of what I do in my therapy. It's not treat, it's not fancy interventions. It's not changing anyone. It's having a back and forth about the beliefs that they have internalized that are really, really incorrect, inaccurate and harmful and that are causing them confusion. And so today, um, the next few minutes, if you're, I hope you're still with me. The next few minutes, I want to talk about these myths and I'm gonna, I, there's so many of them, but I chose the six best, what I consider the the best of the best, the most common misconceptions that I've heard over and over again from clients in my practice. And what these misconceptions do in therapy is that they are stop gaps. They prevent exploration. They prevent the work. They prevent conversations from happening. They create power struggle, confusion, animosity. They are unproductive. They are stop gaps. So that's these six that I feel are the most significant stop gaps in therapy. And that's why I chose them. And knowing these, just quickly knowing these six myths, it can help us do the work. It could help us normalize, reassure, teach accurate facts, set realistic expectations. There's so much we can do when we just talk about accurate information. Here are the six myths and their names. You up the floor. I'm going to take a drink again. Excuse me. All right. Our first myth for today, our first misconception is what I call the sexual interest abnormal belief. 
I think it's pretty easy to understand. I, I, I have a little cartoons here of what a student or a client might say and what a therapist might say back. But there are two versions of this. The first version says, what's wrong with me? I'm not obsessed with the opposite sex, right? Why am I not constantly looking and feeling and aroused and fantasizing? My peers seem to be doing that. I watch TV and it seems like everybody's hot for the opposite sex. What's wrong with me? And then the opposite, a same sex abnormal belief. I had this crush. I have a, I, I really like this guy. I really like this girl. What's wrong with me? Am I, is, does this mean I'm gay? Right? And so here, this ties very much in, of course, to the over pathologizer profile. But this is a very, very common, uh, people are paying a lot, a lot of money to debunk these myths. And they ideally would just go to their parents, they go to their rabbis, and they could say, there's nothing weird about this. Not all people are obsessed with the opposite. Not all normal people are obsessed with the opposite sex. And some of them, in fact, who are obsessed, they are the unhealthy ones. Or second, it might be that you're shut down. Who knows what's going on? We have to find out. Maybe, right? Recently, I met a young woman and she was completely and utterly, she's a workaholic. She was a workaholic. And so when she met men, she just wanted to get through the dates. She didn't care about them, but she liked looking at pretty girls in their dresses and, and watched, uh, watched attractive celebrities. She thought there was something wrong about that. No. And... And the same exact thing with men, especially if they're growing up in same-sex environments. There's nothing weird about that. There's nothing weird about a crush, a fantasy. Even recently, I had a guy, and he got drunk with his friend. He's uh, in his 20s. He got drunk with his friend, and they ended up fooling around. Never happened before in his life. He never wanted it. Oh, my God, he was having panic attacks. And I said, what do you expect? You're in this bedroom together. You're very close. You're drunk. This is the Torah says, or the brighter what says, the Torah says this is out there in the world. We have to watch ourselves. It's normal. It's normal. Let's go to our second, the lust connection belief. I cannot tell you how important this and how common this belief is. And this belief says, similar to, the, to this smug guy right here, uh, relationships need to have that immediate lust factor or they're boring and not going to last. People believe that if it's that it's a sign of a good relationship if they have that immediate lust and a sign of a eh, relationship if they don't have it they're literally defining their relationship potential by their lust so if they happen to have a lust trigger for the same sex you could imagine that they're going to go on a date with javi in the hilton and drink ginger ale and why would that be interesting to them of course that would be interesting but they're not Nobody is getting this high lusty arousal in such a setting. They're getting to know each other. Um, people are constantly making these comparisons uh, that they should feel lust, that that's a sign of a good relationship. Um, yeah. This, the lust connection belief um, can be uh, can be dealt with very easily by talking about by first of all naming it this is lust this is not how you're supposed to connect to people in real relationships and i always say you know first your head then your heart then your groin do you think they're good people with your head do you feel you feel something you feel a kinship a connection a bond and much later there'll be the desire and the fireworks but that's not supposed to happen until until later and we teach, so we teach them a Torah view of intimacy, pleasure, and desire. And we teach them the difference between lust for strangers versus intimacy in relationships, right? A lot of young people are learning, even if they don't have anything same-sex attraction related, they're learning, I should be hot and bothered, excuse my crassness, I should be hot and bothered on my dates because this is the way attraction, this is what attraction is. So, they're, so lust and attraction, those two words, those two ideas, are becoming conflated, and we could quickly debunk that. Myth number three, it's similar, but this goes to the essentialist philosophy that we discussed earlier. The lust authenticity belief says, if I feel this arousal to the opposite sex, well, I'm straight. If I feel this arousal to the same sex, I'm gay, and this is who I am. And here again, I don't have to get into detail here because hopefully now you understand we can educate, education here, not therapy, education. 
call. This is call, and you can read what this kind woman is saying to, uh, to this man. Um, we tell them what it's called. We tell them that we're not picking on them, that they have a same-sex uh, lust trigger. We would say this to people with an opposite-sex lust trigger. Um, and the arousal is important to understand because it usually has a story that points to other stressors in their life, right? And and of course, nobody has to define themselves by this by their lust triggers. They don't have to define themselves and their core identity, and they don't have to define their future by it. Even, I want to say something a little bit risque, even if they're addicted to their lust trigger, should, should they define themselves by that addiction? Now, some people might say yes, but I say no. I used to work in a, in a for example, I used to work with um, sex, a group, uh, I used to run sex offender groups in a, in a hospital. And these were, these were people um, who've done pretty, pretty awful things. And it was a men's group. And some of them were attracted to children. Some of them uh, were attracted to violence against women. Some of them um, would expose themselves in public. You get the idea. <laughs> um, wonderful. Some of them were wonderful, but they had these uh, symptoms. And surprise, surprise, at least half of these men had described having very wonderful marriages and very uh, long-term relationships with girlfriends who had nothing to do with their lust trigger. So they, yes, they had this sort of double life, but um, this just sort of said to me, wow, you, you know, you can get married. You can have a happy marriage. I'm not recommending this, but um, you could have a good marriage even if you have a, an addiction, of course, we want to manage it, et cetera. But um, we don't want people to define themselves and their relationship potential by their lust trigger. The informed consumer belief is our fourth. So we have three more. Thank you for sticking with me. Three more. The informed consumer belief. This one's an easy one. I check. Look at this guy. I checked the client or student imagined them saying this, I checked Google and talked to my gay friend. And from what I described, I'm definitely gay. So there's a belief. I believe this belief is held by many young people, but also by their caregivers, therapists, and first responders who think without really thinking, this person must know. They must know if they're gay. They just know. They're informed. They've read. They've talked. They, they must know that this is who they are. So I could just assume that they're right. And this is very dangerous. We can't assume, and I, I don't think, uh, I think if you're an experienced therapist, you already know when somebody says, I have ADHD, well, let's listen and make sure, right? We're thinking in the back of our minds, I have uh, this personality disorder or this issue. We are always uh, making sure that the client is not coming in with misinformation and incorrectly diagnosing themselves, which could have massive, massive life ramifications. Okay, so this informed consumer belief is out there in the world and our culture, our secular culture, is empowering young people to be overconfident about their identities. That if they say so, it's true. And they're not just overconfident. They're using slurs and guilt slogans to silence people that question them. Oh my gosh, you're so homophobic, somebody would say. As soon as you ask, how do you know you're gay, right? These, the culture is giving young people so much power which of course explains the trans movement. These uh, young people, even children sometimes are being told they know, they know they're mature enough and they're intelligent enough and they're informed enough to know their true gender, even if it, defi even if it is completely against uh, physical reality. So we wanna slow down and make sure we have all the information. The mental health affirmation belief, probably the most controversial one I'm gonna discuss today. So hang on to your hats. The mental health affirmation belief says that blanketly across the board, therapists, rabbis, and parents, or anyone who comes across a person who says they are gay has to affirm this identity, has to say, yes, I, I agree. I agree. You are gay. Even if they inside their minds are saying, what? I don't understand. They have to affirm it because otherwise there's danger, there's risk. The, the person is vulnerable, we have to affirm it, or it's going to be costly on their mental health. It, this is a huge, maybe sometimes this is true, but this is generally a huge manipulation. And it's causing young people to, it's causing again, that's that stopgap in therapy. And take a look at what this, 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 this young woman is saying here uh, in that green uh, balloon. When you ask these detailed questions, you seem to be questioning my sexual orientation and not affirming it. Are you homophobic and a conversion therapist? 
they are now the culture is allowing people to question people who are asking who are who are being just curious. I'm giving a, in this in this orange balloon. I have an example of what a therapist might say back. Um, I'm sure there are better ones and, uh, and many different ones, but you know the one here I have is therapists. We, we ask details. This is what we do to help people. So that's the mental health affirmation belief. And, and I want to add here, it's not always in a person's best interest to affirm, to blanketly affirm their orientation if that orientation is an incorrect assessment, right? If they actually have a lust trigger and they're walking around thinking that they are gay and because they are gay, it's causing all kinds of problems, interpersonal and internal, we want to find a way to get in there and say, hold on a second, let's, get in, let's, let's find out about the details here and make sure you're using the right name Right? So that gets us to my last myth here. Maybe also a controversial one. Harm, the harm to women belief. I cannot tell you uh, how often I'm hearing, and this is much more for men than women. Uh, obviously, yes, the harm to women belief. Uh, for men, men are believing that if they have any kind of same-sex attraction, they uh cannot marry they cannot date until the, this is removed or fixed and if they can't remove it or fix it they cannot marry and they are traumatized by the media's obsession and the lgbtq's propaganda which which uses which guilts and fears people to get married if they have a same-sex attraction because lest they harm the spouse now of course this happens but notice how blanket it blanketly is it is applied so that men, even if they have their lust trigger under control or are not at all fantasizing about it, they too are coming to believe that they should never marry. And um, and it, then the second problem with this is that why are other populations not being warned to not marry? Why are so why are we not talking about why is the culture not talking about? Uh, narcissistic personality disorder and the harm that that causes on on women and the divorces that are, arise from that personality disorder. Why are people with gambling addictions uh, not warned to not marry? So there's almost this like spotlight on men with same sex attraction who should not marry that is causing that is really really ramping up the fear factor and causing otherwise very eligible wonderful men from not even beginning to date. And I came across this very recently, a guy who described to me his lust trigger. He thought he was gay. I told him, my friend, this is a lust trigger based on what you're telling me. And he was very relieved. And he said, but I still can't, can't date and can't marry. And I, and he said, I, I still have this, you know, I said, are you thinking about this lust trigger? Are you addicted? Are you? He said, rarely, rarely, maybe when I'm stressed out, I sometimes have a fantasy. This guy, I would call this guy, you know, not, not bad. And he was he was a wonderful, brilliant, ter terrific person. And he would not date. He was so afraid from his friends. His friends, this came from his best friends, were telling him, "You can't date. You're gonna you're gonna hurt this. You're gonna break the marriage." Um, and they were hearing it from the media. So this is like spreading, spreading like wildfire, and causing otherwise eligible men to to not even try, right? Not even try and just blanketly say, "This is I can't marry." And they want to, they want to in this category. Ladies and gentlemen, this is almost, I have one more slide here. And then I'm so excited to hear from you, uh, to see your faces, because right now I'm staring at my own slides. This, what are some actions we can take right now? Right now. First of all, I'm going to just go through this one by one, starting from counselors. Counselors, therapists, ask details of your clients' complaints. What do you mean by gay? What do you mean by attraction? Tell me more about what this is like for you. You want the details because you want to be able to say, if it's applicable, you're over pathologizing this, you have a lust trigger, or I think you're drawn to the identity here. Maybe that's not going to, maybe it's not a great identity for you. Um, so you, then second point, you don't have to walk on eggshells. The culture says, just affirm, just tell them that they're good and affirm and, and or help them to come out and help them to see that all their conflict is due to something called internalized, what is it, internalized homophobia. No, do the work. And three, try to find, if, you know, if you have this roadmap of, of uh, over pathologizer, lust trigger and identity diffusion, 
see if your client fits into one of these categories and say it back to them, obviously in a sensitive way in, in, at the right time. Identify and debunk misinformation. All these myths, these six myths that I talked to you about today, they're out there, they're in people's minds and they should be brought out into the open. People who say, I want to be gay. I'm desperately needing and wanting to be gay and they're from, why? We have to ask, why, what, you know, we have to ask and we can't be afraid. Don't assume that the clients have all the, all the information. And of course, if you're confused, we need each other. We, I need you guys, you need me, we all need each other. We have to, we can't feel like we're, we're, we're practicing in fear and in, and, uh, and in an atmosphere where, where conversation can't happen or we're, we're afraid to say the wrong thing. I'm sure I've said several wrong things today. We can't be afraid, so people will correct us. Teachers, educators, rabbis, this is my recommendation, take it or leave it, to challenge the ideology of sexual orientation, the idea of being inherently gay, it's so harmful, it's so unscientific, it's so not Jewish. This is a philosophy called essentialism. And gay scholars are telling us that this is so demoralizing and disparaging and incorrect and inaccurate. We have to undermine the ideology because if we don't, people are going to just continue to gravitate to it. And I know that's complicated and I know that's scary and I know that's controversial, but it's something that I believe we need to do early on, early on in our education. And, and of course, I think you all know this by now, do not question or criticize the behaviors of individuals and groups. They're, everyone's doing the best they can with the information they're being given. We have to challenge ideologies. We have to teach misconceptions and facts. And we have, and one of the most important ones, in my opinion, is teaching the difference between lust for strangers and intimacy in real relationships because the two have become fused together so that young people are coming into dating and marriage with wrong expectations. By the way, many, many husbands and wives that I work with tell me, why am I not spontaneously desiring my husband the way that they that it happens in movies. I'm, you know, I'm sitting on the couch and I just don't want to jump on them. <laughs> What's wrong? And they can't believe it. They're so imp the, the lust, the idea that there's just immediate lightning lust uh, that should it should come right away with no work, with no context, with no connection, is impacting many, many people in the community. And for both, uh, for both counselors and teachers, the message that I end today with is to, to teach people the following. And I think this is so important that we have to teach the opposite of what essentialism teaches. All human beings are inherently capable of feeling physical and sexual attraction to any other person when there is a chemistry bond and a desire to connect regardless of gender, age, type of relationship and appearance. Right? I, a story I often tell my clients is when I used to work in a hospital and there was this uh, secretary who I would see, and she was not the kind of, let's just say she was, she was an elderly lady. <laughs> and let's just say she is not the kind of person that I would normally notice. But we talked every day and I would tell her about her life and she would tell me about, uh, I would tell her about my life and she would tell me about hers and we became good friends. And I noticed, confession, I noticed uh, bubbling up, uh, you know, a feeling, I wouldn't say a sexual feeling, but a certain kinship, a certain physical energy, a certain, a certain admiration, a certain, you know, something a little bit more than friendship because we had this bond, we had this chemistry bond. Now, fortunately, I didn't have a desire to increase and enhance that bond. So I was able to keep a boundary, but uh, this, this is an idea that I believe people should know. Um, people should know that even if they have the most profoundly uh, ingrained lust triggers, lust triggers that go back since they were eight years old, it doesn't mean that they can't connect with somebody else. If they have basic interpersonal skills, basic uh, abilities to talk to someone and to get to know someone, they should feel some excitement because it, with somebody who they have the right chemistry with. And this is a very, very, I think hopeful, I hope this is a hopeful message for young people and for yourselves to remember and to teach. And I want to just draw your attention. One last thing is just, I have this, I have five, this appendix of five sort of uh, cheat sheets of different things that you might look at um, depending on your interest. If you're interested in more information and more of my ideas, you can find them in these uh, one, two, four, four appendices, appendixes, um, and please feel free to, to look at them. 
And please feel free to reach out to me. If we don't get to hear from you today during the Q&A, please, please feel free to reach out to me, email, phone, uh, or through Dr. Newhoff. Thank you very, very much. And I now want to turn to you. And I'll stop the share. Okay. So, okay. wonderful. Yeah. All right. It's great to see you all. Um, Dr. Newhoff, do we have questions already? Should we? Well, if anyone would like to ask, you know, you could use the reactions tab on the bottom of the screen and use the raise hand feature, and then we'll unmute you to ask. Yes. Uh, while we're waiting, can I ask? Yeah, go ask away. Yeah, so, um, yeah, it's brilliant, you know, your your conceptualization and your um, the three categories. So I'm wondering if you would, your comments on acknowledging a category of those who, who, uh, um, never felt any attraction to those from the from the opposite gender. Always felt, you know, from you, when they were young, feminine interest. Um, always had attraction to those from same gender. Um, not necessarily related to a lust trigger. Will would would can there be that fourth category? Who uh, without going into into origins, whether it's biological or not, but can we acknowledge that? Maybe work with them with a sexual flu fluidity type of model. Any comments on that? In my, uh, thank you, great question. And I think, I, I'm guessing many of you have that question. And there was a time where I did as well. Um, and I don't believe that that is a thing. I believe, and that's why relating to the last thing I said, we all have the potential to feel feelings of longing and admiration and closeness when we connect with someone. Even if people have only a history of liking the same gender and not connecting with the opposite gender, right? And sometimes there are common sense reasons for it. For example, you could imagine a, a boy very shy and insecure. He might be more comfortable with his male peers and very intimidated around uh, around women. That could be a you know a common sense reason. There are often just common sense reasons for that pattern uh, that don't have to do with their inherent potential. How does that sound? Um, yeah, okay. I mean, what's good enough for now? <laughs> yeah, we'll allow other people to ask. We'll come back to it if we need. Okay, great. Let me just say two things before we go to the other questions. Number one, just if you could keep your questions succinct, that would be great, just so we can get as many people as possible. And number two, um, we can go, I can go till a, a past 10 30. I'm sure some of you can't, you have other obligations, but we can go, I can go a little bit past if we need to. Okay. Um, should we ask? Should we go in yeah, order? So Ali, Ali, yeah. Ali Cordell. How are you? Shalom Aleichem. Hi. Hi. Welcome. Good. Um, so it, I guess meaning sometimes the framework, uh, meaning like a, a big distinction that shifted for me here in your presentation was to perhaps shift from the language of being gay to this is your lust trigger, at least for me, like that was right, which is maybe easier to um, manage, so to speak. Um, I'm thinking of a, of a specific person who the lust trigger, though, is so strong, right? And it's incompatible with uh, a Jewish identity, right? And literally, like, kind of he communicated to me, like, the expectation for me is to, you know, be Yosef Atzadik for the rest of my life, right? Because this lust trigger is so strong, right? And there's maybe, on the other hand, a revulsion, so to speak, to the opposite gender, right? So I guess my question is, how do you work directly with this lust trigger that meaning around kind of the actual behavior and yeah let me get great question fantastic let me just try and give you different words for i'm the lust trigger is so strong right that, those are the words used i'm so i'm so preoccupied with my lust trigger i think that's what that often means okay so now we're talking about somebody with sexual let's name it let's name it accurately we're talking about a sexual compulsion and if he does it a lot, if he's constantly engaging with it, we're talking about a sex addiction. There you have your your refer, you know, if you do that work, great. And if you don't refer to that to that expert, right? I feel like that meaning and and this is, I think, the tricky part of the culture idea, right? Yeah. Is for someone to be lab labeled a sex addict when there's this avenue and this off ramp of 
no, this is my normal, healthy desire, and it's incompatible with Torah Yiddishkeit. It's it is much more difficult, kind of, for them to accept the label yeah. of "I'm a sex addict," right? I didn't even. You could say two things. Yeah, sorry, Andrew. You could say two things. One, I would. You could say, you know, client George. I would say this to somebody telling me that they're that they can't stop looking at at uh, women's legs. I would be telling you the same exact thing. If you're constantly looking for it, you know, if it quacks like a duck, this is what it is. Number one, um, and number two. Um, you could teach them the you know our desires were not meant to be off the charts, which means that there's something. This is a symptom, you know, almost like think of it like phobias, right? Our fear is natural, phobia is not. So a sexual interest in a relationship is something that we were programmed to feel, but to have it constantly overpowering us is a symptom, right? You can teach that idea that. Human beings were not meant to be constantly preoccupied and powerfully uh, and feeling uh, compulsive urges. Right, but so, they're also not meant to be celibate, right? Meaning so... Not meant, not meant to be celibate, meaning like yeah. in terms... In terms of that, that might be the reaction that they feel of like, um, I'm not meant to keep these desires in, meaning that having sexual desire is is normal and natural. And basically the expectation as it relates to Yiddishkeit, is to be celibate from these desires, which feels unnatural, given the fact that sexuality is meant, you know, to yes, be... lust triggers can feel very natural to the person, especially if they've been there since they were eight years old. But if they are ex excessively, uh, if they are pulling on the person to such so that they don't have control, then that is a psychological symptom. And such a person, as I've treated many people like this, such a person can learn to manage it and can learn to feel like, wow, that's just a part of me that used to used to be really compelling that I couldn't stop thinking about and being tempted by. And now whew, it's on the side, you know, I, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not that way anymore. Right. And that's the same way that you would talk to somebody with an opposite sex less trigger. I hope that I hope that helps. Thank you. Okay, sure. Uh, Mr. Uh, Adam Schwartz. Hello. I think you have to unmute. Okay, there we go. Thank you so much for this, first of all. It's a of really wonderful presentation. Thank you. Um, so the, as you mentioned, the mental health community is screaming and has been screaming to this belief that, you know, to do anything different than to embrace and affirm a person's question about their identity um, is dangerous, and you know all these all the statistics about there out there about suicidality and so forth. Um, is there data that indicates otherwise, and how do we get our hands on that? Otherwise, meaning meaning that there is no if we try to do the opposite, like you're suggesting here, yeah. um, that there is no increase in suicidality and oh. so forth. Okay, I'll tell you what there is data on now. Um, that suicidality starts before the question of whether they are affirming or not. That it is actually, what actually causes suicidality and depression and stuckness and victimhood is the very idea that they are inherently trapped by their body, by their biology. Can you imagine a 12 year old being told that you are trapped by your genes to live a life that you never even chose? Do we, is that crazy? A tw can you imagine a 10 year old, a 12 year old, even a 20 year old being told that I would be incredibly depressed. And so when you get to the point of affirming, they're already there. They're already depressed. I mean, not, not everybody, of course, they're already there. And it, and this is an incredible gaslighting tactic. It's the essentialist belief that causes the suicidality, not the lack of affirmation. I hope you thought that incredible yeah. manipulation there. So I hope that makes sense. And, and, and do you have, do, where is there a link to that? I'm sure I could find it pretty easily. We could, I'm happy to talk privately because okay. it, it, would, it would be nice to see that, right? Yeah, I know absolutely. I've read that many, many times, you know, the, the idea that young people who are told or who believe that they are gay before they had a chance to choose it is a source, is a, is a source of terrible depression, even in secular people. Mm -hmm. I think it's, it's okay, well known, but let's find some literature on it. You're right. Yes. Thank you so much. 
Yes, uh, Ruth Silverberg. Hi. Hi. Um, so my question is, having heard a few of these talks um, and knowing that what we know more and more that men's and women's sexual response patterns are really fundamentally very different and thinking that perhaps or probably the issue for lesbian women is also very, very different. So what I'm all I'm going to ask you is if you know of any pointers to people who are doing that kind of research with women, you mean, or yes. just you yeah. know what I'd love, Ruth. I love. I share your question. I'd love to hear more from people who do that work. It's not the majority of my work, but I completely agree with you 100% that people drawn to that are coming with a different picture, a different constellation. Mm -hmm. And my wife is a psychologist and she sometimes works with that. And she tells mm -hmm. me a lot of women are either hurt by relationships with men, either in their childhood or with boyfriends mm -hmm. and dates. They're, they're hurt, profoundly traumatized and hurt. So they're avoiding, you know, you can understand they're avoiding this. Right. They're avoiding this because of trauma. Um, and sometimes you have a, a little bit more benign. They're hope they're feeling, you know, based on the men that they're meeting, they're kind of like, this is it. <laughs> this is what okay. I this is what's available. Um, mm -hmm. I have got a great girlfriend here. And and um, I, I so again, I don't know how common that is, but maybe those are some hints to what might be out there. Does that make sense? Right. Yes. And I think also that the emotional connection, the feeling of she really understands me. Yes. May or may not be much more important. I don't know, since I don't know the men's part, you know. Yes. But, yeah. 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 If you can connect, if, if two women can connect much better than a typical man and woman, you have that mm -hmm. draw. Mm -hmm. And that okay. if that's a common theme, somebody should be talking about this and dealing with because it's, it's a legitimate question. What do you tell? What do you tell women like that? Right. right. They're not. It's not in their head, so to speak. Thank so you, if your that. wife comes up with any ideas, maybe she'll let us know. I, I'm working on her on her giving a, a presentation. We'll see. OK. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you for your question. Thank you. Is this Dr. Press? Uh, first of all, I want to thank you, Dr. Francis, for uh, your presentation. I think you said many very important things. So I don't want people to think that in what I'm going to disagree with you, I'm being at all critical of the 80 or 90 percent of what you said, which I think is correct. Yeah. But I, I do want to make a number of comments. First of all, just Parenthetically, you mentioned there's no way to measure sexual orientation. There are a number of ways to measure sexual orientation. I won't go into that right now, but there are ways of examining that in more detail than you seem to allow. But more importantly, you're obviously very wedded to your theory as if it excluded other possibilities. And that's what most of the questions that are being asked of you uh, are addressing because there are very serious cases which your theory doesn't really address. The question, for example, of the, the people who have no uh, desire at all for anybody else, should they marry or should they not marry? That's an interesting question. There's data on that which suggests that for hundreds of years they have married, they have successfully raised children and had families even when they sometimes, one of the most famous people who broke out as a defender of gay liberation had been married to a colleague of mine uh, and had, I think, four children with her. And I asked her once if she had any sense at all if there was anything unusual about him. She said no, until one day he told her he really has never had any interest in sex. He's going out to free the gays, and he became a great prominent leader. In it. So there are such people, and for whatever the reasons, we don't know if they're biological, we don't know if they're psychological, we just don't know very often, but they are capable of marrying, there's data about that, Yar House has done studies with celibate Christian homosexuals, which are very limited, our community, and with the, the question of success in these marriages, but the, the, the problem of the serious cases has to be dealt with, and I'm, I'm not at all sure that all the useful things you said about the 85 or 90% of the non-serious cases 
will quite do it. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Um, I <laughs> certainly uh, respect that that where you're coming from, and it could be that there are these serious cases. In my view, I've seen so many that do work with my theories that I'm very confident in what I have to offer, and I that I thoroughly reject essentialist thinking. And I think that um, I don't even know what it means, a serious case. Uh, and I can think of 10,000 reasons why a man would not want to sleep with a woman, whether it's his wife or a date, other than he's inherently gay. I could think of 10,000 reasons. So why would I go to the hopeless and ingrained reason when I could come up with 20, okay, I said 10,000, let's say 20, 20 reasons, 20 common sense reasons based on established psychological theories that would that it would explain it better. Well, it's fine if your theories always work. That's great. I, I'm very skeptical that any theory always works. Yeah. That sounds like psychoanalysis. But uh, you know, I know I know of cases who have not been able to have any sexual desire. You, you claim that everyone can have sexual desire for anybody. I'm not sure you have evidence of that. That's a very poor generalization. But yeah. the, the point is that there are certainly a fair number of people who have no desire, whatever, for the other sex, that despite many kinds of therapy haven't been able to, but nonetheless are capable of having marriages, creating families, and those are two separate issues. Yeah, yeah. Can I say something? I hear. It. Thank you very much for your question. Yeah, I hear it. I, um, I'm, I'm just... Who's talking? I thought I heard somebody. Uh, Yosef, Carmen. Hi. Hi. Um, just to that comment on on uh, lack of sexual desire for the opposite sex. I saw some research somewhere. I don't remember who it was from, but I believe it was actually from a gay affirmative orthodox. Um, therapist who said that sometimes the lack of desire is actually was because it was actively shut down when we were raised in our communities where you're not supposed to well let's take a typical example you're not supposed to look at girls right so you you kind of like you see that there's an aversion to it you're doing something wrong you shut it down and you know it's impossible to shut down communication with the same sex you, you have friends you have community you have and therefore, so, whereas one has been the lust trigger, has been stoked and has been um, fired up by interactions with people, um, the the desire for the opposite sex has been actively shut down. And that, you know, just relaxing about it may actually uh, open it up. So just to, to talk to that that point, I wouldn't wonder what you would say about that. Yeah, in other words, so that's one, thank you for your comment, that, that could be one common sense reason why somebody might approach an intimate relationship with the opposite sex and not, they're already, they're, the, the volume's already down uh, to begin with. Um, and, I, and I've read, where did I read this? I think in the book, um, The Joy of Intimacy um, by, forgetting the author's name, very well-known author, The Joy of Intimacy. Um, and it talks about how a lot of people who, are reared in um, in schools where men and women are together. Uh, they're not segregated. How men and women, in order to to just function, you have to turn off the sexual instinct a little bit. So you have to always be in the friend zone with your opposite sex friend, so it doesn't get complicated. And then they might come into dating or uh, or adult relationships with that with that already turned down because they're used to numbing it throughout their schooling. So that's just from the opposite end, um, right? Yosef, you talked about how that could happen when you're in a same gender environment. And I'm telling you a theory of how it could even happen when you're in an opposite, in a, what is it called? You know, together, men and women are, are together, right? Yeah. Um, and we, of course we can't, I also don't want to, to so both uh, Dr. Press's comment and Yosef's comment, um, and I think I'm sure it's obvious, but 
when somebody talks about their low desire in a relationship, again, we have many possible reasons for that, but we can't discount the relationship itself, right? What's happening in this relationship? Are you connecting with her? Is she the right person for you? Is this, uh, is she doing the right things, uh, et cetera? Okay, thank you very much for your questions. Anybody else? A bunch of questions in the chat. Are you interested in those? Yeah, I haven't been able to follow. Do you want to? One of those sent to me, I think. Okay, so let's see. Um, okay, I'd like to know what uh, Dr. Gafran's opinion is on male affirming programs such as Journey into Manhood. Um, Are you familiar with that? I've heard of it. I don't know enough about it to comment intelligently. Um, a little bit, my spidey senses go up when I hear Journey into Manhood. What a just the name is a little off-putting for me. What does that mean? That the people there are not men and they have to become men. So I'm starting, but I don't want to judge by the name. Um, but I, I'm so sorry, I can't, I don't know enough about it to, to comment intelligently. Okay. Is there anything parents should do to influence the sexual orientation of their young children? Well, there is no such thing as the sexual orientation. But I think what you mean is to make sure that they don't <clears throat> gravitate to the gay identity. If that's the question, um, I have actually a handout. One of the appendixes has a handout of the preventative measures uh, that could be taken, things that we should be educating our children about so that they don't go into the over-pathologizing mode or the, or the less trigger mode or the identity uh, foreclosure mode. Um, let me say one thing about the identity foreclosure mode, because it's so difficult to challenge someone once they are already attached to the gay identity, as I've spoken about. We want to make sure that all children are seen and all children's uniqueness are mirrored back to them. And if they're a little bit different or talented or maybe disabled in a certain way, we want to make sure that every kid feels special and has a place where they feel special and they don't feel like they're different than their peers because when you, when you have people falling through the cracks and not and being even shamed or bullied for their strengths and uniqueness that's a recipe for people gravitating to any kind of uh label it's just that's one example of a recommendation i make yeah, yeah that you could find in the appendix thank you for that question we have time for more questions i have a few more minutes okay yeah how, yeah, you're yeah, how can so, I'm going to read, yeah. continue reading from the chat. How can I reach out to Dr. Francis with questions to help others in a project I'm working on my, uh, as a curriculum developer for micro.org? How do you reach out to me? Yes. 917-922-0893. It's on the, fr the first slide. Text me, please not at night. Text me or my email is, is on the first slide, K-O-B-F-R-A-N at Gmail and my website, www.kobefrancis.com. I please reach out to me if you have somebody that could benefit from my approach. If you wanted to schmooze, uh, if you have a question that you didn't get to ask today, if you want to tell me that I said something terrible, uh, please reach out to me. I'd love to connect uh, one on one. Okay. Uh, now, what is the does, uh, what is the website of Kobe Francis? Okay. Yeah, just my name www.myname.com. K O B Y F R A N C E S. It's on the it's on the first slide. Um, is there a list of therapists who use the type of treatment, this type of treatment or approach? I wish, and I love to start a group. If those of you who are interested in becoming uh, part of a, a group that we can refer to each other, uh, or that we can make our our approach more more public, I think that's that would be really cool. Um, but right now it's, uh, I mean, I'm sure many of you uh, practice similarly to me. I don't think I'm super special. I'm just the one talking about it today, but I do supervise a number of people. Um, and I think they have a similar, now they now have a similar mahalaf that I do. So those could also be a resource, but yeah, we should have, a, if, if this is speaking to people, there should be a group of us who, who could be known to help. And again, this is not a one, maybe to mirror what Dr. Press said, you know, not everybody has to like this. This doesn't have to work for everyone, but if it is gonna be helpful for some people, then of course, uh, use it. Um, yes. any, su any suggestions for how a parent can broach this approach with a child who has identified as lesbian for quite some time? 
if ever asking questions in the context of being curious about it, it elicits a strong reaction of feeling unaccepted, etc. My, my heart goes out to that parent and to all parents who are here with that same problem. And they often come to me and I don't have, I don't have great ideas. And if somebody does, I'd love to hear, but the way that to speak to this problem, the way that these people are, are deflecting and, and uh, blaming and react overreacting, it's, I'm going to say something a little harsh, but it's almost like they're, they're in some kind of mind control. They cannot, they cannot hear a different perspective. They cannot engage in a logical discussion. And it is frightening. And many parents are coming to me saying, my child is, grew up as a reasonable person and I can't even talk to them about this in any way or be accused of being homophobic. And my heart really goes out to those parents. This, the child, I don't know what to say to such a child. And uh, open to hearing from okay. people who feel like they've had, they've had luck. I see Rabbi Penner has a question, so I'm going to unmute him. Sure, yeah. Hi. Hi, Rabbi Penner. Hi, Kobe. Yeah. Thanks for the presentation. I think there's a lot that, of important things that you're saying, and I think that there are a certain percentage of cases that certainly fall into your the purview of your theory, and I think we see that. We all see some of that. Yeah. Going back to what a few of the uh, people have raised, and I'm not a therapist, um, you know, as the Vilna Gon said, by the Shita of Rabbeinu Tam, by Yatesa Kochavim, Hachush Machesh. Hachush Machesh, from those of us, including yourself, who deal with so many families, hundreds of families and hundreds of individuals, that there's no such thing as a person who is basically, um, whether it's wired or learned, um, to be attracted to the same sex instead of the opposite sex. I'm curious two things. First of all, the I think I was with you till the last slide, the last frame of the last slide, where you effectively said that anyone can be attracted to anyone um, if there's chemistry there. So certainly I, I know we deal with many, many cases of broken marriages of people who would love more than anything to be able to be in the relationship. Uh, many kids involved breaking up the family 10 years, 20 years, love each other. And yet one of the two parties has no sexual attraction whatsoever to the other and has never expressed any attraction in the dating or anything. But more than that, I, I, I have a fundamental question I'm curious to understand. Um, if, if sexual attraction is a result of chemistry, is there any difference between heterosexual and homosexual activity? In other words, are you saying that heterosexuality is built in, but none of us are built in with homosexual attraction? Um, and that's just a distraction to the built in heterosexual attraction that everyone has. Is it could we just simply say it the other way around? In other words, are you saying that any two men who have the right chemistry would be sexually satisfied mm -hmm. in a relationship and in a marriage? I mean, I think many of the men on this call would feel that that's absurd or that we <laughs> couldn't imagine being married to a man or involved in sexual activity with a man, even if we had a lot of chemistry. And is there any reason from a hashkafic or a psychological reason, uh, basis to say that heterosexuality and homosexuality isn't the same thing, it's just addressed in one direction or the other? I mean, as far as I understand, there's nothing inherently desirous about sex. It's something that HaKadosh Baruch Hu gave us. It's a weird thing to do. There's nothing inherently attractive about certain parts of the body. I don't think we understand heterosexuality. So is there really a difference between heterosexuality and homosexuality? It's a terrible situation to be attracted to people of the opposite of the same sex rather than the opposite sex. But is it really just all about relationship? And is everyone who can't develop a relationship with the opposite sex just not able to develop that relationship? Pachush machish, that that's the case. Despite all of the things you're saying, which I think we're all seeing, with a certain percentage of the individuals who are 
bisexual? Is there no such thing as homo as someone who is basically gay? And if there isn't, is there such a thing as someone who's basically heterosexual? Is heterosexuality a reality? Mm -hmm. Great. Ryan Penner, you are you are asking the fundamentals here. And we have to address right. it. Right. That's what we're trying to understand. Yes, you have to address it. And I'll I'll tell you my opinion and take it or leave it. Um, but in my opinion, there are two there are two laws that I believe in, uh, scientific laws. And the first is the one I said, but you left out one piece of it. The one uh the what I said was that any two people who have a chemistry bond can feel physically drawn to the other, not necessarily sexually physically drawn, you want to give them a hug, a high five, you want to move a little closer to them, a physical draw and an emotional draw to that person when there's a chemistry bond. Now that can intensify when there's the second criteria, a desire to intensify, a desire to go further. And what I believe happens with men is that yes, inherently so, they are just as capable as having a sexual relationship as anyone, Look at what happens in jails and in same gender uh, yeshivas. They are in theory capable of that, but most, mostly, they have they have compartments. They have uh, they have uh, they have some they have a taboo that says no, not going to happen. Not going to do this. Not going to intensify it. This isn't what I want. So I'll I'll manage this um, seamlessly. They're not thinking consciously. Oh, I'm attracted to my friend Bob. And now I have to, you know, make sure I. It's a seamless line in the sand, and this is why I believe the 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 prohibition on homosexual intercourse is so helpful, because it creates a taboo in the world mm -hmm. that we don't have to constantly monitor and think about this. I could be hugging all my friends, and I don't have one sexual thought in my head because there's a line in the sand in my brain that went up when I was three years old, and that will never go down, and. And then, um, but, and I believe that that line in the sand is there for people who also have same-sex lust triggers, and that's why they're ashamed. They're saying, I know this is wrong, and I ultimately don't even want this. Again, depends on the person. They mm -hmm. have that line in the sand in their head, a seamless boundary. And this is becoming less and less so as the boundaries go down in the culture. But at least, in, at least optimally, you have that boundary that keeps... People that, that you have the same boundary. I, I'm going to say something a little bit more dicey, but you have the same boundary in families, right? The, the Torah tells us that incestuous relationships are, of course, terrible and usher. Why would the Torah have to say that? It must be that there is potential for that too, and that the Torah is giving us those boundaries. It's saying, no, these are taboo. This is awful. This is wrong. We don't even have to think. We hug our children. We don't have to think anything. It's easy. It's seamless. And so the same thing happens with men. And again, so back to your back to your point. Yes, two things have to happen: a chemistry bond and a desire to intensify that bond, right? Which is why when I was talking to you about that elderly lady, the secretary in that place, if I want, if for whatever reason, I wanted to intensify that relationship, I could easily have enjoyed myself with that person. That sounds crazy when I say it, but in theory, I believe that that's true, right? In the same way, if I wanted, if I gave my friend a hug and I and I thought of myself as gay, or I said to myself, hmm, let me try this. I believe that that would be very successful. So there's really no natural attraction, so to speak, of men to women and men to men. It's the same thing. I believe it's so but a But a taboo, a taboo directs us into the next stage. Wow, that's quite a theory. I, it sure is. <laughs> and I believe, And I believe it to be true. And I believe that we are socialized to be uh, we're socialized because of biology and because of tradition and culture and religion. We're socialized to channel our sexual energy seamlessly to the opposite sex. The idea, okay. please keep in mind. But that's at the heart of the theory, then. At the heart of the theory yeah. is that really there's no such thing as a natural sexual attraction per se. We aren't, none of us are gay or straight. We all are basically sexually attracted because of because of social norms and right. relationships. Yeah. Okay. We'd yeah, love to see studies on that. And we'd love to see studies on the fact that anyone can develop an attraction for anyone if they just want it enough and they're not yeah. distracted. 
Okay. That would be that would be really important research. Yeah. That would be yeah. groundbreaking. Well, research, research aside, right? Panda research aside is a very useful theory because you can give hope to anyone. Right. Hey, okay. you could say Right. The question is whether you want to give hope to a most... guy who's the question is, again, as someone who's involved with many, 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 many marriages that are falling apart, whether or not we want to give hope to that guy who's about to marry the girl. What would you say? It should we be encouraging him? to get married if he's not feeling a sexual attraction to the girl that he's already engaged to because of social pressure? Should he go ahead and marry her? And as long as there's chemistry and he wants it to go further, it'll work? In the, I'll answer I'll this answer by saying this. In the work, first of all, therapists' offices are filled with people getting divorced for all kinds of reasons. So we don't need to pick on these people and say <laughs> there's Correct. something wrong with them, right? And second, um, Whenever this comes across my office, um, and this could be a very small mm -hmm. sampling, there's always something common sense going on. Huh, we don't connect. I was never attracted to her. She's She criticizes me. I'm overworked, so I'm never ready to have intimacy. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we failed at intimacy because nobody taught us the right way to do it. I could I could go on about a whole list of things that could be there that are much more, mm -hmm. much more common sense than I'm inherent. Then this idea that was created in the at the turn of the 20th century that people are inherently heterosexual, homosexual, and it's a brand new idea, a brand mm -hmm. new idea. Nobody ever talked like this before, right? I'd much rather tell people, oh, let's find out what's going on in your relationship and in your marriage. What's going on, right? Are you speaking to each other? Are you connecting? Is this the right person? When are you attracted? When are you not attracted? What have you tried? Right? Okay. I mean, I think... Uh... It's certainly good to have all of these other options. It's the uh, yeah. exclusion of any other possibility that I find interesting, almost as if it's categorically impossible. And I wonder why hashkafically or psychologically it should be hashkafically. It should be impossible that there is what, uh, you know, Dr. Newberger was talking about, or um, Dr. what Aaron was talking about, what Dr. Press was talking about. I'm just not yeah. sure. There's almost this assumption that it can't be as some have said that the Ribbona Shalom wouldn't create a person this way, or it's impossible yeah. that a person would create this way. And I'm always just very cautious to say what the Ribbona Shalom would or wouldn't do or could or couldn't do. He creates yeah. many things that make it difficult to function. But anyway, I'm taking up too much time. Yeah, yeah, I would thank, add, you, thank you very much. Yeah, I mean, thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you for your questions. I hope I, I, Robert, hope I was able to answer. Robert, Pat, you make some good points, but I just want to add that I have anecdotal evidence, albeit you know, a very small sample size, of men who felt they can never get married and used uh, Dr. Francis' approach, and really they said they aren't fulfilling marriages. So I'm sure there well, are. That, that's the question: there. whether yeah. or not it. Yeah. it, it um, um, and one more point, right, Panner? The 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 difference between us might just be in our philosophical orientation, where I would call myself a social constructionist who is skeptical of the categories. You uh -huh. might you might align with the essentialist perspective, which says there are some people who are essentially gay or straight. So we won't speak the same language if we're in the same, if we're in these two different camps. Right, very sense. possible. And I'm not a yeah. mental health professional, so I'm barely here as a speaking voice in a sense. Yeah. We're talking from different places in that sense, and I understand that. I appreciate yeah. it. Thank you very much. Thank you for your questions, really. Thank you. Is there time for one more? We can get one more in, I think. Okay, so we'll, Dr. Uh, Shores, let me just... Um, right. um, Unmute. Dr. Schwartz, could you talk? Yeah, I hear you. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, Dr. Francis, it was an excellent speech. Um, I'm assuming you can't speak like this in a lot of places in this uh, country. Um, uh, there are not a lot of forums that will allow this, but uh, it was excellent. Um, I have a couple comments. I think they make reparative. I never say I'm a reparative or conversion therapist because it's a very political statement. Because compar uh, conversion therapy or reparative therapy is simply an attitude that you can try to help somebody become or regain heterosexuality has nothing to do there's no techniques they use it as if that there's it's a vi almost violent type of therapy it's what you said it's 
just your normal therapy, uh, you're just doing it with people who have this issue. You're not doing anything crazy or or, or what whatnot. So it, it's used in a political sense. So I, I think anybody identifying with those words are making a big mistake um, because it's just going to bring uh, the wrath of of uh, uh, the, the, the the political situation about this whole issue. Um, second thing is that. Um, uh, I'm assuming you've read the the, uh, the Lubavitcher Rebbe's statement on it from 1986, uh, where he says that uh, a person actually can come into this world, Hashem can bring a person in with, with this inclination. It's not necessarily going to happen because of certain psychological things that occur. He can actually enter the world with that, which... The idea of that frees up, I think, a lot of therapists where they don't have to always figure out why the person thinks this way. They entered the world this way. Um, and the third thing I want to just say is I find in my work that pornography, I use the expression, it nourishes this stuff in a wrong way. In other words, a person can be watching pornography, can go be going to therapy, but the pornography nourishes the aberrations. Um, they, they get nourishment, and psychological nourishment from it. And I find often they have to stop the pornography on that issue. Yeah. Right. Do you want to, should I respond to that now? Oh, you got frozen? It sounds like he got frozen, so you might as well respond. <laughs> okay, I, uh, I'll respond. Uh, Dr. Schwartz, feel free to come back if your reception is back. Um, yeah, or not, I mean, this goes, less, like I said earlier, if it's a lust trigger, it's very addictive. And porn is is uh, is, is, uh, is uh, at a theater near you, at a, at, a, at a screen near you, very easy to find. Um, and often, I, I agree, often, uh, obviously, it uh, exacerbates the addiction. Um, and so you would certainly want to address that issue. But I would address that issue the same way I would address somebody who's watching, uh, a man watching uh, women on porn. The same stressors, the same triggers, the same mechanics. Uh, it's really, right. not for me, it's not a different thing. And it's always interesting to see, well, hi, you like this is what you like. Where do you think that came from, huh? And they, they, you know, nine out of ten times they'll tell me right away. I was playing in the field with so and so, and I saw this. I was in the shower, and this happened. They, nine out of ten times they know exactly where it comes from. And uh, it's always, you know, it's it's fascinating. It's fascinating. The development of lust trigger is something that I spoke about in my first talk. So if you're interested more in the psychology of that, the mechanics, the defense mechanisms involved, the trauma. Please, uh, please reach out to get that recording. Um, but it's the same mechanics, uh, no matter what the trigger is, whether it's smoke, like a client that I described, whether it's a body part of the opposite sex or the same sex or a certain type, same mechanics. Now, I don't do anything with that in therapy. I don't say, well, now that we know the mechanics, we can undo those mechanics because I'm pretty sure that those lust triggers are not, I'm not going to be able to take away the the arousal from that. That sounds crazy unless I do some crazy um, conditioning, you know. But the point is that they shouldn't be preoccupied or addicted to that. They should not feel like they, they are constantly going to it as a drug and as a stress relief. And that's where therapy is very helpful. So, yeah, I want people to make sure that to make to, to understand in my approach I'm not taking a. I'm not taking away a person's lust trigger. There's no way to do that. I'm not saying after being through with this therapy, you will no longer desire the thing that you have desired since you were four years old. I mean, maybe some people can do that. I'm saying you will not be thinking about this. You will be. Your life will be full and rich and meaningful and connected, and you will not need any drug, whether alcohol, drugs, gambling, porn, lust. You'll be in a better place. And if you fall, so to speak, you'll know why. You'll know what needs to be done. Thank you for your points, Dr. Schwartz. And I, I like what you said about reparative and conversion. They're such, they've become so politicized and 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 taken away from what people actually do. 
right? That um, it's, right. Un it's, it's unfortunate. Um, yeah, but I hate to, and maybe I should not have generalized uh, like that about them. But yeah, be that as it may. I think we're out of time, folks. I can't thank you enough for your for your attention, for your for your joining me today, for your taking time for this really really important issue. Even if you disagreed, I hope you get something out of it. And um, please feel free to be in touch. And um, thank you, truly, truly, thank you all for being here. Thank you all for listening. And I wish you a really good day. Thank you, everyone. Yes, we'll send a follow-up email. Uh, okay, great. Yeah. Right. Thank you, Dr. Newhouse, for making this possible. Thank you, Dr. Newhoff. We're again making this possible. Thank you. And thank you, Dr. Robert Breiderwitz and Gary Schiff again for being uh, such such uh, such good motivating people on this. Thank you. Thank you.